Good morning, afternoon, evening, night. Welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we're going to be going into Unit 5, Topic 9 of AP Psychology, an introduction to intelligence. Now there's a lot of information in this video, so let's just start off simply by defining intelligence and then go over the different ways we can measure intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to learn from experiences, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. Essentially, it's the ability to acquire and apply new knowledge and skills. Now, I'll be honest, this is a pretty abstract definition of intelligence. If you remember back to our Unit 1 videos, we talked about operational definitions. If we're going to measure something, we have to be able to define it and be able to measure it. This is where intelligence tests come into play. Individuals such as Charles Spearman believe that we have one general intelligence. This is our mental abilities and is what is normally measured on a standard intelligence test. Spearman believed that we could look at intelligence with a single score. He believed that people could be better at certain activities, but believe that individuals who would score high in one category often also did well in other categories. He used factor analysis to look at different clusters of related items and called this general ability general intelligence, or G for short. This idea was somewhat controversial and was not accepted by everyone. In the 1980s, individuals such as Howard Gardner sought to redefine our understanding of intelligence. Gardner identified eight different intelligences, which you can see here. He also identified a possible ninth intelligence as well. This showed people that there are different types of intelligence. One person may excel in the field of mathematics while another may excel in sports. Depending on who you are, you will excel at different intelligences. Robert Sternberg agreed with Gardner about there being multiple intelligences, but thought that there was more than just the traditional intelligences. Sternberg believed that we as individuals have multiple intelligences and those intelligences can be broken down into three categories or intelligences. There's analytical intelligence, which is when we're trying to solve problems that have a single right answer, such as the test at school. There's also creative intelligence, which is our ability to create new ideas and find a unique solution to problems. And practical intelligence, which helps us with everyday problems and tasks. Here we are trying to problem solve issues that have multiple solutions. This theory later became known as the triarchic theory. Now before we go into intelligence tests, I also want to highlight emotional intelligence. This was proposed by Edward Thorndike and defined by Peter Salovey and John Mayer. This intelligence is made up of our ability to perceive emotions, understand emotions, manage our own emotions, and use emotions when trying to critically think. Traditionally, when trying to assess a person's intelligence, people would take an intelligence test, which would give an individual a score, comparing them to others. We can break these tests into two groups, achievement tests, which attempt to show what an individual has learned, and aptitude tests, which show an individual what they can learn. For example, right now you're in AP Psychology, and at the end of the school year you'll take the AP Psychology National Exam. This would be an achievement test. If you go to college, you might take an entrance exam, which will try to see your ability of what you can do in college. This would be an example of an aptitude test. Over the years, there have been different ideas as to what creates intelligence. Individuals such as Francis Galton and Charles Darwin believed that people were naturally born with a high ability. Galton sought to prove this by running different experiments, comparing different individuals to show a correlation between reaction times and intelligence. His goal was to find a simple intelligence measure and ended up yielding some poor results, but he's been Credit is one of the first people to believe that we could quantify intelligence. Other individuals such as Alfred Binet expand our understanding of intelligence and also helped laid the groundwork for the education system. Binet and his student Theodore Simone sought to better understand how people developed. They believed that children followed a certain intellectual track. They sought to better understand each individual's mental age, which is the level of performance that typically happens at a set age. To measure this, they used aptitude tests to have students solve different problem-solving questions. This would be used to better understand which classes certain children should be in. The goal of these tests was to make sure that children were put in appropriate classes, which would help them grow intellectually. Later, Lewis Terman, a Stanford professor, would take Binet's test and modify it to determine what level of intelligence that people were born with. This became later known as the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. It was from these different tests that eventually the intelligence quotient, or better known as the IQ, came to be. This was created by William Stern, who took the mental age of individuals and divided it by their actual age and multiplied it by 100. So for example, if you have a mental age of 20 and you're 20 years old, your IQ score would be 100. But if you have a mental age of a 30 year old and you're 20 years old, your IQ score would be 150. Now the IQ score works okay for children, but it's not the best at representing intelligence for adults. And while the term IQ is still around, most tests do not use the original formula anymore. One other reason why the old IQ scores may not be as relevant today is because of the Flynn effect, which is over the course of many years, the average IQ in society will rise. What was once considered to be a high score 
score no longer is high. Psychologist David Wexler wanted to expand our understanding of intelligence and created the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. The test uses 15 subtests that have individuals look at how objects and concepts are similar. The test also has individuals use different vocabulary to identify concepts and objects. The test uses abstract processing to have individuals create concepts or objects, and as individuals use letter and number sequencing. This test provided an individual an overall intelligence score and also an individual score. Now throughout our lifetime, we continue to learn and grow and expand our knowledge base. Our intelligence is theoretically always changing. We can look at our accumulated knowledge and our verbal skills, which traditionally increase as we age, as a form of intelligence. This is known as crystallized intelligence. Or we could look at our fluid intelligence, which is our ability to quickly reason and break down abstract problems. This traditionally decreases as we age. This is because over time, our processing speed starts to slow, and it takes more time for us to complete certain mental tasks. Now, I do want to highlight that intelligence tasks by no means are perfect. In fact, they can sometimes oversimplify these complex topics, causing inaccuracies. For example, people with savant syndrome, which is a condition where a person is limited in a variety of mental abilities and has exceptional specific skills in a few areas. This is related to autism spectrum disorder. A person with savant syndrome would score low on an intelligence test, but would have genius-like abilities in specific areas, such as drawing or mathematics. There's also a problem of the stereotype threat, which impacts a person's ability to perform on assessments. This occurs when people are put into an environment that treats them differently than other individuals. For example, students who are seen as trouble or low performing will often accept this categorization and perform lower on their tests. Jane Elliott illustrated this in her Blue Eye Brown Eyed Experiment, where she separates students based on their eye color to show the impact of racism in the education system and society. Students who were put in the dominant group showed increased test scores and increased confidence, while students who were put in the oppressed group saw their test scores decrease. So we can see that the theory of intelligence is ever evolving, and what we know today may be different tomorrow. But now comes the time to practice. Answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section down below. Also, don't forget to check out my ultimate review packet. It's a great resource that'll help you with everything AP Psychology. It'll definitely help you with your A in your class and a five on that national exam. As always, thank you so much for watching. I'm Mr. Sin, and I'll see you next time online.